tell you, I'm having a real good time with Stranger Things. I loved this part one uh, of season four, episodes one through seven. It has the feels of those classic blockbusters. I'm talking from Back to the Future to even a little bit like Jurassic Park. It really is like Back to the Future. And you, I think a lot of us felt they couldn't recapture that cinematic feeling anymore. And for them to do that with this show, uh, it's beautiful. I love it. And I went to the Stranger Things Experience in New York City the other day. If you're in the New York City area, I highly recommend it. They really went over the top on this. And I got a shirt. Stranger Things, I got the logo shirt. They had other shirts, but I wanted to, you know, simple was best, like that great iconic logo. And I got this drink cup, because I was, I got the VIP ticket. So you could buy this too, but I got, I got a free ticket and a free gift. Uh, you get to cut the line, it was great. I highly recommend it. I'm just, I honestly just went on my own, you know, with my, with my friends and family, I had an amazing time. And I want you to be able to have a good time. It runs all the way through the end of July, so go, go see that. Boy, I really love this show. All right, so you have also made it through all nine glorious hours. Oh, you're cheating. But go back and watch it if you have not seen it. Uh, of Stranger Things 4, part one. So now we can talk spoilers, including that amazing finale. How, oh, the finale of part one. How great was that final reveal? My jaw was on the floor. I mean, I knew that Jamie Campbell Bowers orderly, orderly was up to no good, and I suspected he was number one and Vecna, or had something to do with Vecna, but I never guessed he was also Victor Creel's son. I thought that was some demon that was haunting the house. They got me, they got me good. When they had that reveal, I was like, oh my God, of course, it's so beautiful in its simplicity, but yet you hit it so well. I'd be curious if any of you guessed that in advance. I'm sure, and also, did you really? I mean, wow, it was great. He killed his mother, his own mother, who was trying to get him to go to a doctor because she suspected that he was the one causing the problems in the house. Then he killed his sister and he passed out before, I, th I thought he passed out before he could kill his father because he was new to his powers. And then he was like, what luck, my dad takes the, takes the fall. But yet everyone thought that the whole family had been killed because Dr. Martin Brenner, who his mom had called, whisked him away uh, to, a le to the lab. So he ended up being locked up in a lab anyway, despite killing his, whole fa his mother and sister. I mean, that was really good stuff. That was excellent. I loved it. Uh, I, they, they really got me with that, that final twist. Twist upon twist upon twist. I loved it. Uh, his motivations were a bit wonky. You know, for, he was just bad, apparently. But it was still a great twist because it was right in front of you the whole time. Like, you weren't like, oh, come on, no one could have guessed that. You were like, oh, you did it. That was a good one. And also, I think what really seals the deal is how great a villain Vecna is. From whoever's doing the performance under the, all that makeup, which is so cool and so well done, to also Bauer's performance as the orderly. That was some charismatic shit. <laughs> I loved it so much. All right, we also learned that he's the very first person to have these special powers, and that Eleven was part of this project by Dr. Brenner to replicate those powers and probably get someone a little easier to control than number one. I don't think they ever revealed his name. I looked in the credits and the son uh, has not given a name. Peter Ballard is what they call him in the in the credit list, you know, for when uh, for for the for who Jamie Campbell Bower is playing, but maybe that's his orderly name. It was, Brenner kept being like, he was so suspicious of him. And I'm like, I can't believe you kept that guy around as an orderly around all these other children. But anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. Eleven was the only other child in the program to come along with powers at the level of one, potentially. So he helped her to get to his level uh, so that she could help him escape and then also to team up with him. I thought Eleven had killed everybody until right toward the end when I was like, ah, the orderly did it. And then of course that was indeed what happened. But then she didn't stay in the closet and saw that he had killed everybody and banished him to the upside down. She opened the first rift and he turned into Vecna. Uh, on, the, on the press screeners, the VFX on that sequence were a little wonky, but it was still very cool. But a little part of me was sad because I was like, we're not going to see any more Jamie Campbell Bauer because he's really an asset to this show. So good. It's just as cool as Vecna, but I like both of them. Maybe he'll like talk to her through his mind and that's where we'll see Jamie Campbell Bauer again. Again, great mystery. And all the puzzle pieces come together, I feel, in an incredibly satisfying way. Bauer. Let's talk more about Bauer. I loved his hair. He had this sweet, wonderful sides, you know, frontal sweep when he was the orderly. And then when he got, when his powers were unleashed, 
he became like super cool and he got you know a little bit like his hair moosed by his powers. I was like, that's hilarious. Of course his hair looks cooler when he becomes, you know, his powers are unleashed. It was just a really funny uh, detail that I really liked. It was so great. And the way he subtly communicates with Eleven up until that point. Like I loved when he tapped the one spot about who he was talking about on that puzzle she was working on, you know, to reference number one, who he said, well, who knows where one is, but he was sitting right next to it. But that was really good. I thought this was a star turn for Jamie Campbell Bauer. If I were another studio or Netflix, you know, a lot of times people like to keep this talent they discover with them, I would sign him up for something immediately. I was really, really impressed with him here. And also, again, that Brenner would keep him around as an orderly, even when he was, maybe he felt that this guy would somehow be helpful, but that he could, Brenner felt that he could still stay one step ahead of him. Brenner always thinks he can stay one step ahead of everybody, and he never does. But that seems very weird. Brenner is a monster, but you know, is he a monster? But I think he has monstrous elements, and I think that's why he's a perfect person to talk to Eleven about superhero versus monster. That was one of the greatest speeches on the in this season, part one, in episode seven, where he says, you're dealing in these absolutes, Eleven, uh, superhero, monster, the world is not so black and white, there are grays. He's like, I should know. <laughs> oh, it was great. I thought that was a wonderful speech. And I think actually very true about what, you know, about real life. And he said, you know, he said, what have you done in the flashback to help see, to help sell us and Eleven on it being her fault that she killed all those people? Uh, but I mean, he'd seen the security tapes since then, so he knew it was one. But I, I don't know why he couldn't just tell her that and be like, you're not a monster. That was some other dude. Let me tell, let me show you the tape. You know, let me show you the security tape. But I guess it had to be done this way, not only to unlock, uh, unlock Eleven's mind and therefore her powers, but I guess it's also more cinematic. So anyway, very funny stuff. All right, so Vecna, once, he, once one becomes Vecna, I realized that all the things that come out of his back when he plugs in to power up, I think are a spider motif. It's like his legs slash a web, and I thought that was very clever. I don't know why he likes spiders, but he did. And that motif was carried out into the, to his uh, branding as, a, as, a, as the big bad. I like the way he slowly moves towards his prey in the dream sequences. Uh, a little bit like ba Robert Pattinson's Batman, who of course co-starred with Jamie Campbell Bauer in the Twilight movies. But that was just great. And I like the way you could first see like the glimmer in his eye, which I guess is really one underneath all that. That was great. I thought that was just so, so cool. Uh, I loved it. It was just excellent. Uh, anytime I, we saw Vecna, I was like, now that's a villain. And I loved the kills that Vecna did, twisting the bodies. And the VFX was so convincing. You know, I mean, for anything, particularly a streaming show, but even like this was not just for a movie, but a good movie in terms of the VFX. I thought that was amazing. And I thought that it was very Nightmare on Elm Street. They really borrowed from that a lot. And that teenagers are being killed kind of like in their nightmares with their guilt being used against them. And that's why Robert Englund is the cameo as Victor Creel, uh, one's father, it turns out, was a clever choice because even though it was such a small cameo, it ties into that reference. And I, then I thought it was a great reveal that the gates were being opened up. I too was wondering why there was a gate underwater. And that's because the gates were being opened up uh, by Vecna and he needed to sacrifice a, a teenager uh, and their guilt to do that, to open up the gate. So wherever there was a kill, there was a gate. Where is the gate where that, uh, that boy who worked at the newspaper is? That you would think that it's right in the middle of the highway? How has no one seen that yet? But I thought it was, it was a great, really clever twist. And again, it really made sense once they revealed it. You were like, oh yeah, it's all there. I love that stuff. I think that's very clever writing. I thought the whole sequence where Steve, Nancy, Robin, and Eddie were trapped in the Upside Down and they had to communicate with um, uh, uh, Lucas, uh, 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 Dustin, and Erica, uh, that was, um, and who was, uh, and Max, Max joined them, uh, you know, because I liked the shot where they were on the bicycles uh, in real life, and then you would go to the Upside Down and the other group was on bicycles too. Ah, that was great. Of course, a, a reference to the famous E.T. visual. Uh, a lot of, you know, it's no wonder it's in Back to the Future was produced by Steven Spielberg. So no wonder this feels very Spielbergian. Uh, but yeah, I thought that was excellent. But I liked even before that how they communicated via light bright. I thought that whole sequence was, again, visually interesting and also very clever in the way it was done. And then the way they got through the gate, 
Oh, I loved it. And I didn't see it coming. Again, they kept getting me. I'm pretty good at spotting stuff in advance, but maybe it was, a, I think it's partially how well the show is written and also just how much they had me in it. I was just like, oh yeah, this is great. But the way that when Nancy went through the gate, Vecna took her and transported her to his own area of the Upside Down, that was a great twist. and makes even going through a gate scary, even through walking through a door. Oh, that was, just, and they did it so good. They got you, because when the, uh, when Robin and Eddie first went through, they were like, oh, it's fun, this is a treat. Oh boy, it's like a ride. And then it was not a ride, it was very serious. So that was a great misdirect. As for the rest of this review, uh, I wanna break down the rest of it by storyline. And we have four of them, four storylines, which are of course converging for part two, which will be two episodes, but four hours of entertainment, July 1st. All right, so the 11 storyline. Uh, I really thought it was brutal when it started out. I've never understood bullying, why someone would do that to another individual. And that girl, truly an awful person, just awful. Um, and you know, you really don't know what Eleven could do. It was really bad, and it's 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 on that school for not help trying to step in more and take care of that. I didn't think Mike was a very good boyfriend. I couldn't believe he signed his letters to her from Mike. When that was revealed, I was like, she's got you, Mike, because I don't know how you felt. Again, you could get away with that. And I thought it was funny when she got him back by signing her goodbye note from L. <laughs> great. I was like, Al, you're more like other women than you think. That was, uh, that was really, that was very passive aggressive and I loved it. Uh, and then of course they're trying to set up this love triangle with Will, who obviously we've known has a crush on uh, Mike, but then they're starting to make that more clear. I wonder what he painted. What did he paint that painting that he won't reveal, but they introduced that at the beginning and then it just totally goes away. I also felt I was like, Will, I know sometimes we can't help our feelings, but Mike clearly is interested in Eleven, who's also your friend. Why would you want to potentially break up their relationship uh, when they're, you know, I, I, th I thought it wasn't sympathetic for Will to, to, when I don't think Mike had ever give him any, given him any indication that he might be interested in him. So I felt, it, it, I didn't think that was handled well. Uh, to have, I mean, we already have a great LGBT character in Robin, and it's great to potentially have Will, but I don't think they're handling it well at all. And then I like that also uh, Eleven's missing Hopper, which was very, very sweet. I like that she made her diorama of him. And that class, again, was just awful. Awful! She should transfer. Dr. Brenner and Owens in this storyline, it's fun because they bring the star power, Matthew Modine and Paul Reiser. And I like the bit with the helicopter landing and taking off. That was fun. Although I was like, oh, you shot the takeoff and the landing at the same time. Oh, that was funny stuff. But it was good. They didn't do a very good job searching that house because, you know, search for secret compartments, duh. But anyway, uh, during the Levin storyline, it was good when she arrived at the facility. That was fun. But then I thought for what about one episode when they were there and she was going down memory lane, I thought it dragged just a little bit, just a little bit. But I'm curious to see how powerful she becomes. They really tease that. They're like, not only will you get your powers back, but you'll be more powerful than ever before. And I'm like, all right, let's see it. Will she be able to levitate all the time? I'd like that. So... Um, I hope, I mean, they're spending $30 million per episode, so I'm expecting quite the show when she levels up finally. And then again, what really made this sequence, though, was Eleven and Bowers won. And the VFX on Young Eleven, by the way, were wonky as hell, but uh, that's why I think most of the time she was herself. But, you know, I, I forgive it. I mean, I think that's the best they can do. And, you know, I think it, it got the point across. All right, next up, the Mike, Will, Jonathan, and Argyle storyline is really the Argyle show. He's hilarious. He's so funny. Really, really good. But he steals all the attention away from his co-stars. <laughs> he's a nightmare of a new addition to the cast because he's just so charismatic that uh, the OGs can't compete with him. He, and his dialogue is funny. His delivery is perfect. He's great. He's like the Dustin of this group. Uh, incredible shootout though. That's what I thought was one of my favorite parts of this storyline. You know, when they ordered the pizza and the way that was edited together was great. Cause again, you were like, oh, Argyle's coming with their pizza. I, I, I loved his little thing about, do you want to try pineapple on your pizza? That was great. And then when they opened the door, it's not only uh, uh, the military, but our own military shooting on our, you know, it's like a uh, friendly fire, but intentionally. That was just crazy. That was, it was so well shot and the stakes were so high. That first guy got, you know, uh, well, he actually lived because he was being tortured, again, by our own military. Um, 
But then that was just an amazing shootout. I thought that was absolutely incredible. And it was very War Games. And they had a War Games reference when they made that phone call, you know, the, the number being hidden in the pen. I thought that was great. Great, great stuff. But then I thought the storyline also dragged when they went to Dustin's girlfriend's house, which was like a total ripoff of Wes Anderson. And that father didn't look like he was the father of those children. I was like, where'd they get all this zaniness from Is there, if their father seems so unzany? And I didn't see the point of it. It just seemed to be clever for the sake of it instead of, it was very odd. It was very off. It didn't fit with the rest of the whole show. Although I was glad that Argyle met someone. I liked them. I thought that was cute. Moving the buyers to California is great for the story. And uh, I liked the intro about how California is different from where the, you know, from Hawkins and the stuff about flowers. That was all very pleasant. But I have to say, it's been a horrible development for the OG characters who had to move. Except for Eleven and Joyce, because they left the storyline, right? <laughs> California is Argyle land. And I gotta say, he's a very good representative of California. All right, next up, Dustin, Lucas, Max, Steve, Robin, Eddie, and Nancy. Oh, there's a lot of people in this one. Uh, Eddie, another great new addition. It's competitive on this show. You got, you know, the new characters are strong. Uh, I loved him from the Hellfire Club stuff. I loved when he said, get your Bo Peep on and go find somebody else for tonight's game. That was great. So I like the way he, I also really liked the way he interacted with Chrissy, that he wanted to be close to her. Maybe he liked her a little bit. Um, I, but yet they were came from different worlds, but yet they actually weren't so different. I thought those scenes were really sweet and handled very nice. And I think they were really good in that they set you up. They set you up to see that Eddie was a nice guy. Uh, Chrissy's boyfriend, though, and the basketball team also factor into this. And that's interesting because I think it really explores mob mentality and the very real problem in the 1980s that a lot of people felt that Dungeons and Dragons, just like people are talking sometimes about video games today, that they have a negative influence on society and the people who play them. Uh, and it's just as ridiculous then as it is now. But I think it's very interesting to explore that. Uh, by the way, I love seeing Rob Morgan on this show. I'm a big Rob Morgan fan. I'm always happy whenever I see him. And he's been on past seasons working for Hopper. But now he gets to take center stage as a new sheriff because Hopper is obviously otherwise occupied <laughs> all, the way, uh, all the way in Russia. But Rob Morgan, I think, you know, in a, in a very small role, really pops and does a lot to stand out because he's just a great charismatic actor. I, I think he's doing a good job, unlike his, new, his deputy, who's an idiot. Uh, but that is so often the case. Uh, you know, but, you know, Rob Morgan's sheriff is doing the best that he can. So, and he has a lot to contend with. Uh, the parents, I don't think, are doing a very good job of protecting their children in this scenario. But, you know, they can't be that good or these characters wouldn't be able to run it off and do all these adventures. Uh, and then also there's the Lucas aspect to this, where they put him with the popular group, which I thought was fascinating. Uh, when I rank the characters, we'll talk a little bit more about his basketball game. I'll just say here that I think they should have moved the D&D &D game because the D&D &D game it does not have an opposing team coming to visit and a ref. It's like, it's a very different scenario. And I think they should have moved it. I, I was with Lucas on that one because that game was important to him. And it was sad that nobody was there. I didn't even see his family or his sister. The sister was a D and D, uh, which was too bad. You know, I was very happy when he won the game. Uh, you know, so he was, he's a popular kid. And I think putting him, they did that so that he, you, we would have somebody with that group as we see that mob start to form. And then of course he did a very good job of setting them on a wild goose chase. Uh, and then I thought, you know, Lucas and Max, I'm not really feeling the chemistry between them here because they're broken up, I guess. But it's funny, I was going to say they didn't have any chemistry, but on the Stranger Things experience that I did the other day, uh, they had a, a really great virtual, re virtual. Uh, well, it was 3D, but it was so good that it felt almost virtual reality. And they had a lot of these actors participating there. And Lucas and Max were there, and Lucas put his arm around her, and they felt very much like a couple. I was like, oh yeah, they are a couple. They are a good couple. So maybe... Um, and they seem to be get, maybe getting back together, so maybe we'll get to see that at some point. I'm rooting for them. Uh, Max, though. Oh, Max, what a superstar this season. I loved the whole letter that she wrote to Billy. I loved everything that she was doing to, to deal with the scenario, because, you know, you know, Vecna wanted, you know, having her number, her, her up next, supposedly. I thought that was fantastic. And I love that she was brought back by music. Oh, that was just incredible. It was such a great idea. And to make it, again, more cinematic. And I was like shouting at my TV screen. I was on the edge of my seat when she was trying to run. And 
and get to uh, to escape the upside down thanks to the music pulling her back. I, I was worried she wasn't going to make it. I was worried they were going to cut to the next episode. I was like, don't you end it here. Because that was the end of four, right? And they only gave me four at first. And I was like, oh my God, Max, don't die. And I was so happy that she was okay. That was great. Loved it. Nancy and Robin at Penhurst Mental uh, Hospital, that was a little ridiculous. They were able to sneak in like that and see a high-level patient. I don't care where you're going to school or who vouches for you. That seems ridiculous to me. But it was a nice silence of the lambs nod. I think that's why they did that. Uh, and when they eventually decided to make a run for it, I thought that was fun. Good, good for them. Good for Nancy and Robin. And I liked Robin's flirtation at the beginning of the season with that other girl and band, but I felt bad that they dropped it. Uh, I mean, I guess they had to, but I liked that. I thought it was great. And I really thought that the Robin talking about how she, in, in the 1980s, in a small town like that, she can't afford to make a mistake and out herself to someone who wouldn't be receptive because it would out her to the whole community. And I thought they did a good job explaining why it was like why Robin felt as trapped as she did and wasn't sure what to do. I love that. Robin's a great character. Steve and Nancy getting back together though. I got to tell you, I'm not sure I like this. I think Steve is stuck in life, so he's like, why not go back to when life made sense? Why not go back to Nancy? Because he can't find anyone else he likes. That's never a good excuse to go out with someone that you can't find anyone else. If you, you know, you, they broke up for a reason. Uh, Steve's an awesome guy. I love Steve, but I just don't see him and Nancy as a couple. And I think that Nancy, she's moved forward. I think she's having problems with Jonathan, but that's not a good reason to go with Steve either when her life made sense. I did think it was funny though when Steve took his shirt off to dive into the water and Dustin's like, when did Steve get so hairy? And uh, Lucas is like, why doesn't he shave? And <laughs> Dustin's, I'm just going to recreate it for you because it was so funny. And Dustin's like, uh, he says girls like it. And then Max, like, Max is like, let me see. And she takes the binoculars and doesn't give them back. I thought that was hilarious. I loved it. It made me try and take a closer look. I was like, oh, let me see. Uh, and I have to say, you know, you know, well, it was, you know, you can decide for yourself how you think Steve Harrington looks, but I thought it was very funny. I thought they handled it tastefully. Uh, Steve and the Upside Down, though, they did cut there to another episode, and I was like, boy, I sure hope he doesn't die, and I'm not sure the jury's out on that, because he got some pretty big bites to his stomach. I was like, oh man, I don't know how he's going to come back from this. Is he infected? I would think there would be repercussions to that. You know, Robin was talking a lot about rabies, so they should really keep an eye on Steve. I got to tell you, I don't know if he's going to make it out of this season alive. Uh, but, you know, I could maybe understand because I don't really think he has that much to do. I think Steve might have run his course as a character, even though, again, I love him. Dustin, though, Dustin, you know what occurred to me through here? Because Dustin doesn't really have his own storyline. He's just kind of in everyone else's. And he's great at it. He's like the Dan Aykroyd of the group. He just rem He's turning very much into Dan Aykroyd in Ghostbusters, which is great. It's great to have a Dan Aykroyd type character. All right, then the final storyline I want to talk about is Hopper, Joyce, and Murray. Ah, oh, this is a great one. And it's really good to have a strong adult storyline to balance out all these kids. And, you know, you got Brenner and Owens over in the, in the 11 storyline as well. But this was fantastic. I didn't understand, though. Hopper, didn't he break his ankles when that uh, other prisoner freed him from his chains? Or at least tore up his skin? That looked so painful. I had to look away when he was sliding off his shackles. But then how was he running and walking everywhere? I was like, wouldn't he at least have a limp? I don't know, it was fine. And then I liked the twist that he escaped, but then he somehow got turned, you know, the, you know uh, Yuri had turned him in. And so he went right back to prison. And Dimitri therefore got, you know, in, in prison. I thought that was a great way to keep the storyline going and raise the stakes. And I loved Dimitri. I was like, where do I know that guy from? It's from Game of Thrones. He was the faceless man who trained Arya. He was great. I love him. I loved him throughout this. And I liked the two of the best moments for Hopper here were the last meal where Hopper tells them what's really going on here. Uh, and then also that, what do you know, lucky, lucky them to some degree, he actually has experience against what they're fighting. So that was great. He was like the guy being like, let me tell you about what's, what we're up against. Like that kind of old trope in uh, movies and stuff. I loved it. But then I thought his monologue about being cursed or perhaps that he was the curse was interesting. At first, I didn't understand why they were taking so much time with it, that he'd been exposed to Agent Orange in Vietnam, uh, and that that was what he believed was actually the cause of his child's death. 
I was like, what? where is this coming from? Why now? And then I was like, you know, maybe because he was kind of experimented on by the government, that makes him very much like Eleven and gives him even more reasons for them to be a good father-daughter duo. Um, and, I, and, and also because maybe, you know, we don't know about Eleven and whether or not she can have a family. Uh, so they make a family together, Hopper and Eleven. And I wish that point had been made a little bit better because once I realized that that's what that monologue was doing, I was like, oh, yeah, that's pretty good. And Joyce and Murray, boy, I, I particularly love Murray. I'm a big Murray fan. I love that shot into the plane, by the way, when they were going to Alaska and the sh- shot goes like from the plane, it comes out of the plane window and shows like Air Alaska going along. I was like, that's an amazing shot. That's a movie level shot. And I love that Murray's karate actually worked. What a great development. So often, of course, they try and do the karate chop and then it's, it, it, it's, it's just ridiculous. But he actually took out Yuri on the plane. He was helpful in the prison with his karate. He actually fool, fooled the head of the prison. I was so, it's so great when characters are successful in the adventure. I love that. And I love that he swapped names with Yuri because, you know, it started out as a joke and then he's like, I'm going to become Yuri Murray and, it was, and that they rhymed the names. That was fantastic. And then the payoff with Joyce and Murray being there when Hopper and, the, uh, and Dimitri, et cetera, had to face the Demogorgon, that was incredible timing. That was great. And I believed every, I was like, of course they're there at the same time. And then they helped them open the doors and then uh, get out of there to escape the Demogorgon. Although I, I, did, I think, did Hopper kill that Demogorgon? That was great when he threw the spear when the light burned out. And I was like, you got him. But I don't know if he killed him. I hope he did. It would th- I would think he did because it went right into his brain, I would think. But when the second group of doors opened and Joyce was standing there and the look on Hopper's face and her face and then they hugged, they didn't kiss, but they've, I don't think they've ever kissed before. So I can understand why they maybe didn't kiss then. But it was so satisfying. I was like, that is a great moment. What a great payoff. I loved it for the characters and for us watching. And I love that Enzo's was the code name because that was their missed date. I was lo- it was great. That was very romantic. So in conclusion, I think this show, this season, part one, is extremely well written and directed, largely due to the Duffer brothers. They did three of the seven episodes and they're doing the final two totally. And they're like movie level at this point. So somebody should scoop them up to do a movie. I would definitely hire them. Uh, this has the complexity and the simplicity of those classic blockbusters like Back to the Future. Like Lost was just overly complex and they didn't have, that's the thing. This show has answers to every question it raises, and that's so great to know that you can trust the storytellers instead of being like, you don't know what the answer is to that either, do you? Here they know, and it's great when they, re- when they choose to reveal it to us. So, and I love that the stakes are so much higher. I don't, I, they can't all make it out of the season. Uh, I've, 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 do you think they'll all make it out of the season alive into five, or season five, or do you think that we might lose some people? I, I don't know. I have mixed feelings. The cast is so big, I think we can have some dramatic deaths. Let's see what happens. Let's see. So that's my, fo- uh, my spoiler review of Stranger Things 4 part one. And I'm very curious to hear your own thoughts down below. And I'll be doing a character ranked video as well. So I'm curious to hear your rankings too. So share those thoughts down below, subscribe today. And of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now. 